Pastor Jim Rose here from the North Buffalo Grace Brethren Church in Catanning, Pennsylvania. I want to thank you for tuning in, and I want to thank you again for allowing me to share God's precious Word with you. You know, sometimes we go through difficult circumstances, and these folks in the Bible here that we're looking at, they were going through very severe persecution, and God was writing to them through the Apostle Peter to encourage their hearts. And so I've titled here the, the message today is The Certainty of Our Salvation. Uh, when we look at our salvation, especially our future part of our salvation, it really encourages our heart. Well, the most probable date for uh, 1 Peter is just before Nero's persecution, which followed the great fire that ravaged Rome in the summer of A.D. 64. The absence of any uh, reference to martyrdom uh, makes it uh, less likely that the epistle was written after the persecution began, since numerous Christians would by then have been put to death. It is believed that Nero set the fire in Rome and then blamed it on the Christians, which brought about persecution for them. Well, 1 Peter was written to Christians who were experiencing various forms of persecution. Men and women who stand for Jesus Christ Christ made them aliens and strangers in the midst of a pagan society. Peter exhorted these Christians to steadfast endurance and exemplary behavior. The warmth of his expressions combined with his practical instructions makes this epistle a unique source of encouragement for all believers who live in conflict with their culture. In verse 1, Peter, the inspired author, identifies himself and, and those to whom he is writing. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Well, Peter identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. But first of all, let's look at his name. The name Peter is the Greek translation of the Aramaic Cephas. The name Jesus gave Simon when he was called to be a disciple, according to John 1, verse 42. As an apostle, which means sent one, he was commissioned by the Lord Jesus as one of the original twelve, called to be the herald of a glorious, transforming message. Peter describes his readers in their earthly condition as pilgrims, meaning a stranger or sojourner. And this term can denote those who are temporary residents or who are foreigners or refugees. Peter goes on to mention that these pilgrims or strangers were of the dispersion. You say, well, what, what, is, what is that talking about? Well, this word means scattered throughout. The apostle addressed not only Jews who were dispersed from their native land, scattered throughout, uh, but Gentile believers, both of whom were spiritual strangers in the world they lived in. Peter's letter is addressed to churches and provinces located in modern-day Turkey, which were part of the Roman Empire at that time. In verse 2, the recipients of the letter are further designated by a fourfold progression of their salvation, which involves all three persons of the Trinity. Peter declares, verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. He says, grace to you and peace be multiplied. I'd like to say, first of all, that we could probably spend a whole message on this one verse. And there's so much in this verse, but we're just going to just touch on it a little bit and go on uh, to what I really want to share here this evening. Well, first of all, they were elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. They were picked out. They were chosen. Even before God made this world, he picked them out that they would belong to him according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. He said, in sanctification of the Spirit. Sanctification means that they are set apart by the Holy Spirit, that would be part of God's family for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. It is Jesus' blood shed on Calvary that made it possible that we could be rescued, delivered, brought into the family of God, and our sins could be completely 
taken care of. He says, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Well, after the salutation in verses 1 and 2, Peter presents the certainty of our salvation by revealing how it is preserved, first of all, by the power of God in verses 3 through 5, and then how it is tested and proven by the trials of God in verses 6 through 9, and then how it was predicted by the prophets of God in verses 10 through 12. Let's look at verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter sets forth the unique glories of our salvation. He begins with a doxology, a hymn of praise, praising God by calling for praise to be given to the author of our salvation. He says the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This title presents God in a twofold relationship to the Lord Jesus. The name God of our Lord Jesus Christ emphasizes the humanity of the Savior. The name Father underlines the deity of God's Son. The full name of the Son is given, first of all, as Lord. That means he is the one with the exclusive right to rule in hearts and lives. And then as Jesus, that means he is the one who saves his people from his sins. And then he is said to be the Christ, Christos, the anointed one. He is the God's anointed one who has been exalted to heaven's highest place. He sits at the right hand of the throne of God, interceding for us. It is by God's abundant mercy, Peter says, and you say, well, what, what exactly is mercy? Well, that is his compassion and his under, the undesired, undeserved favor to us that he has, that is, God has begotten us again. That is, we have been regenerated, born again, born anew, spiritually, to a living hope. You see, Hope for a Christian is different from those in the world. For a Christian, it is confident expectation that good is coming based upon the promises of God. And as you know, God cannot lie. Therefore, a living hope is a hope that is active. It is sure, certain, and real, as opposed to the deceptive, empty, false hope that the world offers. This living hope is never extinguished by untold circumstances, just as living waters are waters flowing fresh from a perennial spring. And as we think about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, it is the righteous basis for our salvation, as well as the foundation of our living hope. Romans 4.25 says, who, that is Jesus Christ, was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. The resurrection is the Father's amen to the Lord's cry, it is finished. Also, that resurrection is the pledge that all who die in Christ will be raised again from the dead. That is our living hope the expectation of being taken home to heaven to be with Christ and to be like him morally forever. Aren't you looking forward to that? I'm looking forward to the time when I'll have my glorified body, no more pain, no more sickness, no more sin. All that will be gone and will be in the presence of our Lord. Wow, what a lot to look forward to. Verses 4 and 5 describe the future aspect of our salvation, Peter declares to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. You see, when we are born again, we have the absolute certain hope of an inheritance in heaven. The inheritance includes all that we will enjoy in heaven for eternity and all that will be ours through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The inheritance, he says, is, first of all, incorruptible. Well, what does that mean? Well, that is, it can never corrode or crack or decay. That means it is death-proof. Also, our inheritance is undefiled. That is, it, that is, it is unsoiled, unpolluted, unstained by evil. It is flawless and perfect. 
That means it is sin-proof. And our inheritance does not fade away. That is, it will never lose its magnificence. It can never suffer variations of value, glory, or beauty. That, that is because it is time-proof. Won't that be wonderful? It seems like everything here, don't we? We see, we even you buy a new car. It's not long, it loses its new car smell, and it's not new anymore. But not, that's not going to be what uh, that way with our inheritance in heaven. It's going to be new forever and will never change. Peter goes on to tell us that our inheritance is reserved in heaven for you, for us as believers. The term reserved here is a participle that reveals the fact that the inheritance is already, that it already exists. Yes, it's already there waiting for us. And it's being preserved for those who are now being guarded. We are being guarded for it. Not only will that inheritance not change, but no one will be able to plunder it or take it away. The Lord is keeping it safe for us. Next, in verse 5, Peter explains that those who possess the heavenly inheritance are also guarded for it. For it. He says, in verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Well, not only is the inheritance divinely guarded, as we were talking about, those who possess it are also kept by the power of God. Kept in what way? From doing anything to forfeit it or be severed from it. God's power is his um, a sovereign omnipotence that continually protects us as his elect. If God is for believers, no one can successfully oppose them. As Romans 8.31 reminds us, if God be for you, who can be against you? All the details of this promise are to provide the believer with an undying hope of heaven as to provide joy and endurance. Yes, when we're going through hard times and, and persecution and difficulties, it's a good time then to look up and, and remember the promises of God. Remember our inheritance. Remember that one day soon, it could be today, that Jesus is coming back. He's going to rapture us away. We're going to get our brand new bodies. And won't that be wonderful? He says we are kept by the power of God. That is the divine side. But he said it is through faith. That is the human side. This does not mean that a person is saved only as long as he exercises his faith. No, no. Uh, where there is true faith, there will be continuance. Saving faith always has the quality of permanence. This security for the believer and his inheritance are guarded, it says, by the power of God through faith. And he says for salvation ready, excuse me, to be revealed in the last time. Well, let's look at that word salvation. That's the Greek word soterion. It means rescue or deliverance. Praise God for rescuing us from eternal hell. Thank him for delivering us from the penalty and guilt of our sin. Uh, rescuing from this evil world system. Aren't you, aren't you so thankful that he has done that for us? Well, here, it, it, when it talks to uh, the way that salvation is used in this sentence here, it refers to the future tense of our salvation. It is often pointed out in Scripture uh, about the tenses, the way our salvation is mentioned, three tenses of our salvation. Well, first of all, a Christian was saved from the penalty of sin the moment he first trusted the Lord as his Savior. Well, this is the past aspect of our salvation, what we, which we call justification. Then number two, the Christian is saved daily from the power of sin as he allows the Savior to live through uh, his life through him. This refers to the present aspect of salvation, which we call sanctification. Then last, number three, the Christian will be saved from the presence of sin at the time of the rapture. This is referring to the future aspect of our salvation called glorification. You see, Christians possess some of the benefits of salvation in this life. Yeah, we don't have all of them, but we have some of them. But the great 
fullness of, depend, of redemption, I might say, is yet to come. Our full benefits of salvation are yet in the future when we get our glorified body. In verse 6, after, uh, after first reflecting on our uh, protected eternal inheritance, Peter reminds us of our present aspect of salvation, namely sanctification and the things we might go through uh, as believers. He looks, look what he says in verse 6. He says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Well, the words, in this you greatly re rejoice, refers back to the preceding passage, the verses 3 through 5, which detail the great truth that brings Christians joy as they remember what? Their future eternal inheritance. Yes, we, we need to look, look at what God has promised us. Think about what God has, think about heaven. Think about eternal things. And so he says, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. These folks have been going through some persecution. And the Bible helps us to understand that even when we're going through some terrible times of persecution, when you compare that to eternity, that we are going to be with the Lord, it really is just now for a little while. Yes, it really is, even though it might seem a long time, but it is just for a little while. And it says, if need be. In other words, there's going to be times in our lives as Christians that God is going to test our faith. And he's going to allow things in our life uh, to help us grow as Christians. And we always need to remember that God is perfect. He cannot do anything wrong. We need to understand he's sovereign. He's in control of absolutely everything. And we need to understand that whatever he allows in our life, it is for our good. And so we need to remember those things and trust him. And so he says, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. There are going to be times in our life that God's going to allow uh, difficult circumstances in our lives uh, to help us to grow in our walk with him. And so he says in verse 7 that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that it perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, God has a purpose for every test, every trial that we go through. It's just not by luck, and it just not just doesn't happen. God has a plan. And it, he says here that what his plan is, is that through that testing, through those difficulties, it will show, it will come out that our faith is genuine that we truly believe and trust in him. And he says our faith is precious. Matter of fact, it's more precious than gold. Can you imagine that? And he says gold that perishes. You know, one day, the Bible speaks about this earth is going to be on fire and things are going to burn up. And so what's going to test, take the, uh, stand that test of fire? Well, I said even gold will perish. But guess will not perish. What we have, our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, our faith in him will not perish, but be found, he says, to the praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the purpose is of our, our circ uh, hard circumstances, our trials or persecutions, is that, the, again, to show that our faith is genuine, then so that we can see and that we'll be found at praising God and honor Him and glorifying Him, the way that we live, the way that we respond to our problems will bring glory to Him at, when He comes, at the revelation, when He comes back for us. We don't want to shrink back in shame because of the way that we're living. We won't want to say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. He goes on to say, and he was commending these uh, brothers and sisters here who are going through these severe persecutions. He says, whom, ha whom, having not seen, you love. You remember what Jesus told Thomas? You remember what Thomas said? I will not believe uh, until I put my hands in his side and I see for myself. Because the first time that Jesus 
uh, 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 turned, uh, came and, and showed himself to the disciples, uh, appeared to them, Thomas was in there. But the second time he was, and when he laid eyes on the Lord, he says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, Thomas, you see and you believe, but blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. That's us. Have you ever seen Jesus? I haven't, but I believe in him. I'm trusting in him, and that's what we need to do. And so he was commending these folks here, these brothers and these Christians and these believers who are going through terrible persecution. He said, you haven't seen Christ, but yet you love him. Well, how do you know you love him? He said, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So if we do those things that are pleasing to God and we respond to our problems in life that are pleasing to God, that shows that we love him. He says, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. You know, being a Christian sometimes is really kind of odd. You know, it, we... we um, can go through terrible circumstances that can be weighing on us and, and really bearing down and be really hard, but yet, at the same time, we can have joy in our hearts because we know that we are, things are well between us, as, uh, between us and God. We know that if, if we die, we're going to heaven. And so praise God that we're rejoicing uh, that relationship that we have with our Lord. Verse 9, he says, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's, that's what we get when we, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, and then that's what we have is salvation for our souls. Well, in verses 10 through 12 now, Peter is looking at the greatness of our salvation through the eyes of the prophets. Let's look at verse 10 there. He says, for this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Well, this salvation was the theme of many Old Testament prophets. Excuse me. God's agent spokesman prophesied uh, the undeserved favor which, would, uh, which we would receive. But they did not fully understand that. It didn't, they didn't fully understand even what they were preaching about. And, and so he says, uh, they researched and carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come. Uh, and and they, they were looking into the scriptures, but they did not fully understand it. Look what it says in verse 11. Searching water, what manner of time the Spirit of Christ was in them, was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So as they begin to, uh, through the Holy Spirit, search about the, the Messiah and the coming one, they didn't quite understand about him suffering and, 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 and he would die and then he would raise and all these things would happen. It was kind of not, not clear to them. And verse 12 says, to them it was revealed the, that not to themselves, but to us. They were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. They didn't understand those things, but they saw that they were looking into the future, that wonderful blessings that would come to us through the Holy Spirit, and it, the things that were so wonderful, they could see that our salvation was so great that Jesus Christ would go to the cross and die for our sins and rise the, raise the third day so that we could be justified. These were things which angels desire to look in, look unto. Yeah, it's like angels were looking over heaven, the, the, the edge of heaven, looking down, and listed. they were amazed at how God's plan of salvation was being brought about, that God would provide a way for us that we could be saved and know the Savior. And so as we think about these scriptures here uh, given to us today in 1 Peter, let's think about the background. These folks were going through severe persecution, difficulty of life. And God was writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to pee through Peter to encourage them. And, and he began to show our different aspects of our salvation. But it's, it's interesting that after he talked a little bit about how great their salvation was, a doxology, and talking about our, how we were born again uh, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and all of that, 
he began to allow them to look at their future aspect of their salvation. And folks, that's what we need to do. When you're down and out, when things are rough, think about the, your future aspect of your salvation. Glorification. That day and time when we're going to be with Jesus, we're going to be glorified, perfectly sinless, no sin, no uh, problems, no Satan, all that's going to be gone. We're going to have no pain, no sickness. Won't that be wonderful? And folks, that will help lift us up. It'll give us joy as we focus on, not on our present circumstances, but on our future salvation, our, our future promises that God has given us that we're going to be like Jesus morally in his presence forever and ever. May God bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, your word is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing down inside of us, able to change us from the inside out. Father, I pray that you would help all those that are going through hard times. Lord, that you would encourage their hearts and help them. Lord, help us that we will look up, that we will have eternal perspective, that we will focus on our eternal salvation, Father, and draw strength from that to endure through the hard times. Lord, we just thank you and praise you. Be with all our brothers and sisters. Encourage your hearts. Protect them from the virus, Lord. Protect them from the evil one. And just encourage your hearts. We pray, Father, in Jesus' precious name. And amen. God bless you.